Good to see you on this wintry morning. Uh, I think the snow is falling as has been. We're glad you're here. A few announcements this morning. First of all, the flowers under the cross have been placed there by the Burl Nine Circle. Uh, and we're, the sanctuary looks beautiful this morning. Uh, and we want to thank all of those who came out to help uh, put everything together. Thank <laughs> you. 
I want to walk as a, as a child of the light. I want to follow Je Jesus. God set the stars to give light to the world. The star of my life is Jesus. In him there is no darkness at all. The night and the day are both alike. The lamb is the light of the, the city of God. Sign in my heart, Lord Jesus. Last week we lit the first purple candle, looking forward to our first from the story of Christ's first coming and expecting Christ coming again. Each of the candles on the wreath represent Jesus, the light of life. The first candle stands for the promise of God, Jesus Christ, the birth of Son. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary, and he came to her and said, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by the world and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great. He will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him to the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom there will be no end. What amazement to have an angel visit. What amazement. Mary, listen. How many of us hear the angel's voice or even are aware of the, main, of the angels among us? Mary heard and Mary replied, For angels are messengers of God who bring messages and revelation calls for a response. When the, angel, when the angel announced that she would give birth to the Son of the Most High, Mary answered, I am the Lord's servant. To be fully alive is to be obedient to the work to which God calls us. To follow our calling is to be formed by, to embrace the vision of God's calling. The dancer dances, the teacher teaches. To follow our calling is to say yes to the miracle of life. For when we follow our calling, opportunities appear, doors open that we would not know that were there. us 
the, co the courage and strength to respond. Amen.
Then here for Wednesday night, Danny will be over the road ahead last Wednesday. So last Wednesday then you will be this Wednesday's menu. Um, and chicken next. Uh, and chicken next. And chicken the week after. The Christmas Eve service this year, I think we did have it set at 7 o'clock, but we're just experimenting with that. We're going to move it back to 6. Reason being is I don't want to knowingly um, let that have that interfere with what we've already had planned, and I understand that. You know, and so we're going to go back to six o'clock for Christmas Eve service. So, um, and then we'll just try to stick with that every year, so you know ahead of time. Um, so, are you back? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>
glad you came back. <laughs> Wonderful job. And that's a sample of next week's talk. Oh. Oh, that's the last one. We'll be new stuff. So we look forward to that. It's time to go to the Lord in prayer this morning. The ushers will bring a microphone around to you. If you have a prayer concern, please raise your hand and share your concern with us this morning. Over here, Tom. Tom? My brother, Randy. Surgery this week. Okay. Randy Spice. Randy. Randy. Thank you. For Anita Parsons. Okay. Anita Parsons. Thank you. Raise your hand and do it. Jim. Good morning. Good morning. Um, Harold had his biopsy last Thursday, and of course, we didn't get good news. And we go back Friday to see what the procedures will be or you know what they have to do. And I want to thank you for coming and sitting with us while he was having the biopsy done. So it's Thank you. Well, we will certainly, certainly do so. Susie, there's one there. Susie, that's too much. <laughs> We're coming at you from the pool. <laughs> I asked for prayer for my Aunt Joanne last week, and she passed away this Wednesday, and I'd hope to go to the service, but she lives in the snow belt of North Carolina. So I asked for prayer for my cousin, Rose. Thank you, Susan. And prayer for you, too. Okay. Okay. Andrea Vent Deck. She's in the Pond Court area. She's been in and out of the hospital for a year. And last night she had surgery to have a blood clot removed from her stomach in an arm dance in ICU. Last name was? Deck. D-E-D-K. Sandra and Jack.
bring hope to our world. Our prayer today is, Lord, whether it's through power or whether it's through silence, our prayer is that you come to us today. Come unto us in our moment. Lord, let us feel your presence. Lord, we come to this place today trusting God to meet you right here. Lord, we have lifted up many concerns. And yet, Lord, as we did, you knew them not just by name or by need. God, you knew them as your child. And Lord, each of us, no matter what our concerns are today, whether they're big or whether they're small, God, we can lift them up to you. And we do so here and now. Praying, Lord, for each one mentioned today. For Anna, Carolyn, Barbara, the Barbara family, Randy, Anita, Harold, Rose, Tina, Doug, and Susie. For Sandra, and for Gabe, and for Brenda and Dell and Gavin, and Mike. In your mercy, hear our prayers. Yet, God, let each one of these people feel your presence with them at this very moment. And God, and again, we pray for your assurance and your peace that, Lord, no matter what life is bringing to us, you are far bigger. And, Lord, and let us know the hope that you give. Not a hope, Lord, that helps us just to wish, but a hope that helps us to stand firm as we grasp a hold of that anchor of Jesus Christ. And Lord, and let us always, no matter what our surroundings may be, help us to keep our eyes upon the Lord that came for us, that died for us, but in between he lived for us. The one who knew pain, the one who knew sorrow, the one who understood brokenness, the one who lived as we live. May we keep our eyes upon him, for he endured all things including the cross, for the joy that was set before him. Let us continue our walk of faith, knowing, God, we do not walk it alone. And now again, we pray in faith the prayer of our Lord taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done.
These are the, uh, the words of Henry Wadsworth Longfellow from the community. I want to name Christopher Wadsworth in case there was no.
the Sovereign Lord is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn. The word of God is found in the book of Isaiah for the people of God. Thanks be to God. We even reduce history down when you think about it. 
We talk about the six causes of the Civil War, the one main reason for the Great Depression, the 30 true false questions regarding the 18th century. Yet in the back of our mind, we realize there's got to be more to it than that. More than what we tell in just a little bit. Then there's the matter of this day. Or this day right now. Or tomorrow. When or if it ever becomes day. We ask someone, how is your day going? Oh, it's just another day. Or we say, I can't wait for this day to be over. This day has been uh, We reduce days even that way. I think we say those things because really we are hoping for more. We hope for more because we know that there can be more. The audience for our text this morning and it's always good I think if we understand who the audience is in the text. It helps us to understand what the author, where the author is coming from and what it might help us to understand more about it. But the audience this morning that Isaiah addresses are the afflicted, the brokenhearted, the captives, those who are in prison, those who mourn. And I guess in reality, when you really think about it, the audience that he is addressing there could very well be us on any given day or somebody we know the audience that Isaiah is addressing are those who come to church out of a well let's just say a burning hope for more the audience that Isaiah is addressing are those who do not come to church well maybe they did maybe they used to Maybe they just gave up because they gave up hoping for anything else. They gave up hoping for more. The audience of Isaiah are those who have been exiled far away from home. Their past and all the things their past is now nothing more than a fading memory. The temple that they once went to, the temple that they once felt so secure just happening in, it, in Jerusalem was long ago destroyed. And with that, they had to live every day asking, wondering, where is God? Where is God? Where is the one who identified himself over and over and over again as our Lord and our God? Where is the one who promised to never leave us nor forsake us? Where is this God? They, the audience he is speaking to in our text, were forced to live in a land that was unknown to them. Forced to speak a language that was altogether new to them. To become someone whom they really were not. These people lived in a world they did not recognize. That may sound familiar to some of you. Sometimes we look in the world that we're living in, the surroundings, how life changes, one day to the next, and sometimes we may be left to say, I no longer really recognize this world that I'm living in. Yet, Isaiah says that God has intervened. God has anointed one who will take action. Throughout history, we have found that God has intervened. How do we describe God's intervention through history? We have words that we use to describe it. Words such as exodus. It reminds us how God intervened 
to deliver the children of Israel out of slavery. How else did God intervene throughout history? Well, there is Bethlehem. How else? There is Calvary. The empty tomb. The upper room. Yes, throughout history, God has intervened. And without intervention, folks, there would be no hope. For there would be no more. But thank God, because there is God, in circumstances of the worst broken hardness of captivity, or whatever it might be, mourning, he addresses, imprisonment, captivity, and not talking about just the kind that where we are behind bars. Right? Isaiah says there is always more. There is always more. And that's what Isaiah is telling us this morning. The world in which Isaiah speaks in our text is a world beyond present arrangements. You know our God, we talk about how big God is. We often can find even that big God into our past and into our now. But God being as big as God is, and God being eternal, and God being all that God is, is beyond our now. And Isaiah speaks of a time that is not in the now, but it is coming. Reminding them that no matter what your now is like, God is, has intervened. God has intervened. Isaiah speaks of a world, folks, where there is good news. He speaks of a world where there is liberty and comforts, garlands instead of ashes. The Apostle Paul spoke of a similar world, I think, when he spoke the words, I has not seen or ear heard, neither has entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love Him. I think Paul held on to that very same hope. Isaiah, Paul, Jesus, speak about the more beyond the now. Refusing to abide in the confines of rationale. This hope for more causes a young lady, young girl, in fact, named Mary, to sing out, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. Isaiah called upon the people to trust in God to do a good thing. In the cycle of Bible study, we are reading about that, where God is doing, we're about to do a new thing. And really what Isaiah is calling on the people to do, really what Isaiah is calling on the church to do, us, you and I today, it's amazing how scriptures that were written so long ago still speak to you and I today. Isaiah calls upon all of us to trust God. So far as to let God get what it is God wants. Wow. What God wants. I know what I want, but what is it God wants? As we approach Bethlehem on that very first Christmas morning, was that what God wanted? Was that what God wanted? The world then was a world in many ways far removed from our world today. Yet, at the very same time, it was a world very much the same as the world in which we live in. It was a world where people feared what might come 
next. It was a world where people struggled just to get through into tomorrow. It was a world really full of religion. When you think about it. Religion abounded in the world in which Jesus entered. Yes, God entered into a religious world. <clears throat> yet people longed for more. People longed for more. Here in our text is Isaiah's protest, really, against all those things that were. Here in our text is Isaiah's protest against religion. Religion that has been what? Reduced. Reduced. Reduced to what? Reduced to slogan. Reduced to morals. Religion has been reduced to bumper stickers. The other day, Melody and I were driving somewhere and saw a car. And on top of the car, there was a wooden sign that had been clearly cut out. It was in the shape of an arrow. And they had that wooden sign tied to the top of their car. Kid you not, and the sign with an arrow, all it was an arrow, tied to the top of their car, simply said, Jesus. Well, that's what Jesus would probably really love. <laughs> now, what that would say, I have no idea. If they wanted us to see that Jesus was that way, then they may have turned this way and said, no, is he that, or is he that way? I don't know, but I thought, oh my goodness, we've done reduced Jesus to a sign. It's all been reduced. Reduced to sometimes boring rehash of the already known. Isaiah says there is more. There is more. Bethlehem says there is more. The empty tomb reminds us always that there is far more. Advent itself challenges us, folks, to long for more. Advent challenges us to long for the unexpected ways in which God comes to us still yet. Still yet. Advent challenges us folks to long for more, not just for ourselves, but for our world, for our neighbors, for our church, longing for more for others. Why? Because we know there is more. We know there is more. Knowing there is more is sometimes challenging us. And I think Advent, if it does anything, should challenge us. It challenges us in various ways. Just like it challenged the poor father. Out of work, not knowing where the next meal will come. He'd been out of work for a long time, and he walked up on the porch, and there he found his two children <coughs> flipping through the Sears and Roebuck magazine. Remember that? The little Sears and Roebuck catalogs? Flipping through them. Look, every page. Oh, I want that. Oh, that's what I want for Christmas. Oh, if only I sent the father into a rain. Grabbed the catalog out of her hands. Took a switch she had handy and switched their legs. And then took the catalog and ripped it into pieces. And they sat in his yard weeping. Why? Because he knew there was more. But it also challenged that young lady, young girl in a depressed region of Judea. A poor, unmarried mother-to-be. She, too, was caught wishing for more. And she began to sing. 
My soul magnifies the Lord, for he has done great things for me. May Advent challenge us to continue longing for more, because with God there is always more. May the Lord bless you. Let's stand and sing our hymn this morning. The first Noel case to work. Remember, you can have to sit in the box. Realize you're sitting with us. Let me come out here. Cameron, thank you for watching this one. Thanks, 245.
a sample of it. It was still to come, right? True. <laughs> I look forward to it. <laughs> oh, I think it's coming sooner than you think. Only in third grade. Now, dismiss us in your care, we ask in Jesus' name.